What are ideal lab tests to check for type 2 diabetes and for prediabetes? Some of these lab tests might not be familiar. Let's check it out. All right, first one up, C-peptide. What is C-peptide? It's a marker of insulin production by the pancreas. That's the organ that makes insulin. It indicates how much insulin your body is making. Now, did you know that 81%, that's more than four out of five people who have prediabetes, don't even know it? They're not aware of it. So please, test, don't guess. All right, now why is this important? If C-peptide as a blood level marker is high, i.e. it's elevated, it means that your pancreas, the organ that makes insulin, is overworking to produce insulin, which is an early sign of insulin resistance. This can appear years before the A1C number starts to rise. So it's an early warning signal. Now, if C-peptide is low, on the other hand, it could indicate pancreatic dysfunction, that is type 1 diabetes or advanced type 2 diabetes. In other words, the pancreas is no longer making enough insulin to meet your blood sugar demands, your glucose demands. All right, so here's a chart so that you can see the reference range. You change screens, right, bam. So your optimal C-peptide range is going to be 0.8 to 2.5. That's healthy levels of insulin production. At a range of 2.6 to 4.0, this is a warning. As it elevates, insulin resistance is going up. Many people will say C-peptide, if it's, C, if it's um, below 5, you're in good shape, but I really feel like this is more accurate. So 2.5 or less would be optimal for healthy insulin production. 2.5 to, excuse me, 2.6 to 4.0 is a transitional range, and that means the body is, you know, working hard. It's making more insulin in order to keep that glucose, the blood sugar, in a normal range. If it's above a 4, this person is definitely in insulin resistance land and uh, their pancreas is overworked. More than likely, they have prediabetes. It's good to do additional testing, which we're going to cover shortly. And then if it's less than 0 0.8, right, the C-peptide marker, this could indicate possibly they might have type 1 diabetes or other pancreatic dysfunction. It would be good to have this further checked out. All right. So now that we know this, let's consider what else this could mean, right? So you can be prepared. Now, how it helps to detect early diabetes. Many people have normal A1C numbers, but a high C-peptide, meaning that their body is compensating for this insulin resistance. In other words, the pancreas is in overdrive trying to compensate for the problems with blood sugar regulation. Their glycemic regulation is not in a healthy range. Early detection of this allows for lifestyle changes, things that people can actually take control of about how they live their life before full-blown diabetes develops. Think of it as an early warning system. All right, now that we understand that, let's look at fasting insulin. Fasting insulin is a very interesting marker. It's not commonly ordered, and I think it should be ordered more often. What is fasting insulin? This measures the levels of insulin in your blood after a period of fasting. Typically, it's measured in the morning, so before you've eaten anything. When you're asleep overnight, you aren't eating, you aren't drinking. So it's ideal to get fasting insulin measured when you are fasting. So simply put, for most people, if your sleep time is at bedtime overnight, get up in the morning, go to the lab, and get your blood drawn. Okay, that's when you're going to get fasting insulin checked. This shows how much insulin your body is using to regulate blood sugar levels. Why does this matter? If fasting insulin is high, if it's too elevated, it means your body is struggling to control your blood sugar and is likely in an earlier stage of insulin resistance. High fasting insulin precedes diabetes by up to 10 years. Again, another early warning signal. So you want to get out in front of this stuff and not get surprised by it. Because often when these things happen, people go, oh, wait, this came out of the blue. No, it did not. Most of these problems are years, if not decades, in the making. All right, let's take a look at optimal levels. Let me change my screen. Okay, so for fasting insulin, optimal range is to have fasting insulin at 5 or lower. So five or lower is great. There's a low risk of insulin resistance there. Then there's a range here, a spectrum, if you will. Five to 10 might indicate some mild insulin resistance. Maybe it's uh, something to be worked on, or on the other hand, maybe not. Depends on the rest of your health picture. If your inflammation levels are low, cholesterol levels are normal and healthy, then you might be all right. However, as fasting insulin increases, this can become a problem. In a range of 10 to 15 can start to indicate that there is a moderate level of insulin resistance. In other words, the body's insulin is not working as efficiently as well. Similarly, if you're taking injectable insulin, same thing. Maybe your body is not taking it up as best as it should, and you need to become more insulin sensitive in terms of how your cells 
interact with the insulin that's in your bloodstream. This person is at higher risk of metabolic syndrome. So in this case, metabolic syndrome will include high blood pressure, high blood sugar, more weight than is considered healthy for that person. It's a whole complex of problems. Next, if the fasting insulin number is higher than 15, that is 16 and up, it might mean severe insulin resistance or prediabetes. The pancreas is definitely overworking and sending out very clear uh, signs of it needs more support, okay? All right, let's stop that share. So high fasting insulin is an early warning sign of metabolic disease. Okay, so what are your thoughts? Is this information new to you? It would be great to hear from you in the comments below. If you find this video helpful, please like the video, share it, and subscribe to the channel. This way you can help me grow the channel and reach others with this information. Thank you so much. Okay, next up, Cystatin C. Now technically, this blood lab marker is used to assess kidney function. Many people who have diabetes and other blood sugar issues are vulnerable to kidney disease. Now you might wonder why I have this here, so let me explain. I talk about this specific blood lab test here in this context, so you are aware of some other considerations. So adding this lab test can help to increase awareness of potential kidney problems so that hopefully you can prevent and avoid kidney disease. Cystatin C is a biomarker used to assess kidney function and glomerular filtration rate, known as GFR. It is considered a more reliable indicator of kidney function than creatinine, especially in individuals with muscle mass variations. In other words, for people who are more muscular, it is a better lab assessment than BMI or necessarily creatinine when we're trying to really assess what's going on with kidneys. The BMI in general can be misleading for people who are muscular, overweight, or obese. It's not the best marker. And the person who, in fact, uh, created the BMI said, don't use this generally for humanity. And so, of course, what are people doing? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Anyway, here are the reference ranges for size, stat, and C by age group. All right, let me change my screen. Okay, so size, stat, and C in a normal range. Infants, it's this number. Children, this number. For adults 18 to 15 years old, normal range is considered 0 0.6 to 1.20. And then for older adults, it's considered to be 0 0.6 to 1.30. All right, stop the screen share. Now, let's look at interpretation of cystatin C levels. Let me change my screen again. Okay, so the interpretation is this. If it's below 0 0.6, it could mean that that person is really low in their muscle mass, or maybe there's more filtration for them. This can occur if they're pregnant or have hyperthyroidism. So just know there's some variation with that. Normal kidney function for size, statin, C levels would be 0 0.6 to 1.20. When it comes to mildly decreased kidney function, so early stage kidney disease, size, statin, C might measure more like 1.2 to 1.3 up to 1.5. We look at moderately decreased kidney function, stage 3, CKD, which is chronic kidney disease. That number is going to be 1.5 to 2.0. And then if it's above 2.0, the measurement for size, statin, C levels Severe kidney dysfunction, most likely stage four, possibly stage five of CKD, known as chronic kidney disease and indicating possible kidney failure. So this can get serious. It's a simple test, but it's good to have it assessed and measured. I learned about this recently from a friend and colleague who is a nephrologist. So I wanted to make sure I shared it here because many people who are concerned about their blood sugar levels and health with diabetes or maybe a family risk for blood sugar issues, this is just good to know, right? Test, don't guess. Okay, so key considerations here. Higher levels indicate reduced kidney function or chronic kidney disease, and lower levels can be linked to what are considered hyperfiltration conditions. That is early stages of diabetes, maybe the person is pregnant, or they have hyperthyroidism. It's always good to get these things further assessed. So here are some key takeaways for these first three lab tests. And remember, we've got two more coming. Okay, one is that for C-peptide, that it indicates insulin production, these high levels signal early insulin resistance. Next is for fasting insulin. It's a crucial marker for metabolic health. Lower levels equals better insulin sensitivity. Okay, so what are your thoughts? Is this new information for you? It would be great to hear from you in the comments below. If you find this video helpful, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel and can share it with others. Be sure to turn those notifications on. This way you can help me grow the channel and reach others with this information. Thank you so much. All right, next up, A1C. 
So A1C stands for glycosylated hemoglobin A1C, which is a common blood lab test that is a key part of determining if someone has glucose, also called blood sugar, that is in the healthy range or not. This is a part of the assessment for diagnosing diabetes and prediabetes. Hemoglobin A1C is a test that measures your average blood sugar levels over the past three months. Unlike a fasting glucose or a fasting blood sugar test, which only gives you a snapshot, just a picture in time right in that moment, the A1C provides a longer term picture. Again, it's over a three month window. So it detects prediabetes and type two diabetes, even if fasting glucose appears normal. It's also a good assessment for type one and type 1.5 diabetes. Now, why does any of this matter? Why is it important? You could have normal fasting blood sugar, but still be pre-diabetic. I'm gonna say that again. You could have normal fasting blood sugar, i.e. the numbers taken in the morning when you first awaken and before you've had anything to eat, but still be pre-diabetic. The A1C also helps to uncover hidden metabolic issues that might be lurking and that aren't obvious at all from a single glucose reading, all right? Now let's look at these A1C ranges and see what they mean. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, optimal A1C range would be something at 5.6 or lower. Truly optimal will be 4.5 to 5.2%. Optimal and healthy, person is insulin sensitive, all is well, right? They are in the low risk category in terms of metabolic disease. We had 5.3 to 5.6, you wanna pay attention here. It's still normal, still healthy, still okay, but what you don't wanna see is this starting to creep up, 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 up over time, all right? Stay mindful with nutrition, with dietary choices and lifestyle issues in order to avoid creeping upwards into prediabetes. The next range we're gonna care about for A1C is 5.7 to 6.4. That's considered the range of prediabetes. This is where metabolic dysfunction gets started. It's happening and immediate lifestyle changes totally make sense here. Jump on it, don't wait for this to get worse, take care of it. Next, type two diabetes is defined and uh, diagnosed with an A1C of 6.5 or higher. At this point, the metabolic damage is well underway and lifestyle interventions are absolutely needed. It may be required to go on some kind of medication or at least consider it. And if you don't wanna do medication, then you're gonna to have to be on your game when it comes to the lifestyle side. There's those five pieces of lifestyle that make the most sense when it comes to reversing and getting out of the type two diabetes range to go back to prediabetes and hopefully optimally all the way to healthy. That's gonna be nutrition, as the bullseye of our target. The next is gonna be meal timing, the time of day you eat your food and your portions matters. Third will be sleep. Sleep is the huge, beautiful opportunity to reset all of this, right? And get back to that healthy range overnight. Number four, stress levels. Stress is nobody's friend and can absolutely hijack otherwise healthy blood sugar numbers and just make things worse and create diabetes all on its own. By the way, so can disordered sleep, like say sleep apnea. Number five, exercise, especially strength training, help to increase insulin sensitivity, decrease insulin resistance, and get you to the healthy range again. So exercise is absolutely your friend. All five of these things I've just mentioned matter. Okay, stop my share. Okay, so as we continue on in discussing this, some good things to know. The summary here for hemoglobin A1C is that it measures your average blood sugar levels. That is, it detects pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, 1.5, and type 1 diabetes. All right, next up, fasting blood sugar. Some people refer to this as their morning sugars or fasting morning blood sugar. Fasting glucose, we're talking about the same thing. All right, so fasting blood sugar is a key marker of metabolic health which measures glucose levels after an overnight fast, which is typically eight to 12 hours while you're asleep. And then after you're waking, you know, if you haven't eaten right away when you wake up, et cetera, right? So it's quite a nice time window. This occurs at a time period when you're not eating, you're not having anything to drink. So it's a natural fast. It's the easiest, simplest way to do it. Elevated fasting glucose or elevated fasting blood sugar, to say it another way, can indicate insulin resistance, prediabetes or diabetes. All right, let's look at a chart for the reference ranges. I'm gonna change my screen. So when we look at these numbers, let's consider it. If your fasting morning blood sugar numbers are below 70, that might be too low. You might feel a little shaky, you might feel a little dizzy, perhaps a little nauseated, you, you may literally be sweating. So this could mean you have hypoglycemia, maybe you've got too much insulin on board, or you're just not very tolerant to the lower end of the blood sugar range, that's pretty normal, or there's adrenal dysfunction. Okay, so just know that a number below 70 might not be such a good thing. In the range of 70 to 99, 
is considered a healthy range. I would say it's more like 70 to 90, but I'm not going to quibble about 91 to 99. This is better, all right? And it, overall, it's going to indicate good metabolic function and insulin sensitivity. Once we hit 100 and higher for the fasting blood sugar numbers, we really need to be paying attention and double down on all of our healthy efforts, okay? So prediabetes typically can be diagnosed with that fasting morning blood sugar number at 100 to 125. Fasting glucose, when taken this way, as it goes higher and higher, it lets us know that that person's body is impaired. It's not having a good relationship with glucose levels. And definitely is indicating some level of insulin resistance and a loss of insulin sensitivity. And then finally, here, if the fasting morning numbers are at 126 and higher, taken on two separate tests, not a one-off, not a one-time thing, but two separate tests, then you can most likely be assessed and diagnosed with diabetes. In this case, we're talking about specifically type 2 diabetes, where your blood sugar numbers are consistently high. Okay? All right. Let me stop my screen share. All right. So here's our summary. Why do these tests matter? Number one, talking about the C-peptide, this measures how much insulin the pancreas is producing, detects early insulin resistance. Number two, fasting insulin shows how hard the body is working to regulate sugar, can detect insulin resistance years before diabetes. Number three, cystatin C. I put this in here just to bring more awareness to kidney health. And in general, kidney health is very important if you have blood sugar related concerns. This test can be helpful for people who are overweight, obese, or for those who are simply more muscular, where the BMI numbers are just not helpful or are misleading. This screens for kidney disease and can be a helpful marker to monitor kidney function. Kidney function, just like blood sugar function, often is not tested for, and therefore people don't even know that there's damage that's been occurring. The kidneys are vulnerable to the effects of chronically high glucose levels. Next, number four is hemoglobin A1c. This measures the average blood sugar levels detects prediabetes and diabetes over time, typically reflects the 90-day average of glucose levels in the blood. And then number five is fasting blood sugar, also known as fasting glucose. This shows you your blood sugar level in the morning after an overnight time of fasting since you were asleep and therefore not eating, otherwise fasting, right? Not drinking anything either. Sleep is the beautiful healing opportunity every night, overnight, to reset that blood sugar level to the healthy range. All right. So friends, here's your next steps. Ask for these lab tests. Make sure you're being assessed at least once a year and really ideally twice a year if you're otherwise in a healthy situation. If you have other health issues, it's probably good for you to be tested more frequently. Three or four times a year might make the most sense for your health needs. Now, if your doctor only checks glucose or A1C and they don't do any of these other tests, speak up. Ask for C-peptide and fasting insulin too. It's good for you to ask for the size statin C, particularly if you are overweight, obese, or if you are highly muscled. Size statin C will be a better marker for you. So add this to your lab test list so you get a better overall picture of your metabolic health. Detecting these issues early can help to prevent diabetes and metabolic disease. All right, what are your thoughts? Was any of this information new to you? I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. If you find this video helpful, please give it a like, share it, and subscribe to the channel. Kindly turn those notifications on so you know when new videos are posted. This way you can help me grow the channel and reach others with this information. Thank you so much. Please take great care of yourself. Self-care is not selfish.